Speaker. I'm Sidnogama. I would like to acknowledge the Algonquin territory which we meet on today. Many of us have acknowledged the traditional territories of Indigenous nations on which, whose land we meet. Some of us go as far as to say we are on unceded land. How many of us give a thought to what that acknowledgement means? To me, as a Mi'kmaq person, as an Indigenous person, it means that we recognize that another group of humans cared for the lands, protected the lands, and maintain them for future generations. We do so out of respect. Maybe do, we do so out of part of a journey of reconciliation too. And while it's an easy thing to say, it's much harder to practice reconciliation. Growing up Mi'kmaq, you were grown and taught that you were born with responsibilities. Responsibilities to your family, responsibilities to community, responsibilities to your nation, but also responsibilities to your ecosystem. We call it Nedugaluk in my language. When I think about that responsibility, I think about what actions I am willing to take to ensure the quality of life for future generations. I was a protester or a land protector, as my colleagues have reminded me. I too was out there on the streets, frustrated during the Idle No More era of protest under the Stephen Harper government that saw environmental cuts and indigenous cuts. I was out there with them. It was only when a new government was elected that I believed that Canada had reached a turning point, where Canada could look to a new relationship with indigenous people. It was with this in mind I entered politics. And because of the work that this government has done to advance reconciliation, I believed that a Mi'kmaq advocate would be welcomed into government. I still believe this today. I believe that reconciliation is possible. I believe that reconciliation is not a destination. It's a journey. Just like any relationship we hope to improve and foster, it is only possible when we listen. It is only possible with respect. It is only possible when we find common ground. We have reached a moment in Canada like we have many times before. This will not be the first time that Canadians have called for police action, even military action, in the face of civil disobedience and protest. If the civil rights movement in the US has taught us anything, it is that violence, police, nor the, the army will stop a political movement. It will only lead to more political action, escalation, and turmoil. Communication is the only way forward. Good faith negotiation is what the Westerners are asking for. I will not uh, go into the comments that my, my colleague uh, has just talked about with the West Sudan people in their determination and their fight at the Supreme Court of Canada for recognition of Aboriginal title. But they believed it was a victory for them. Many Indigenous nations across Canada believed it was a victory. And many have stated today, Section 35 of our Constitution in Canada, the Supreme Law of Canada, recognizes Aboriginal and treaty rights within that Constitution. Further to that, Section 52 states that the Constitution is the Supreme Law of Canada, and that any other laws that are inconsistent with that are of no force and effect. Therefore, the rule of law is important but we must ensure that the rule of law is applied e equitably among all peoples. We have a crisis, but this crisis did not unfold in 12 days. This crisis did not unfold in 12 years. It's been unfolding for more than 150 years. For more than a decade, I worked for the hereditary chiefs in the Mi'kmaq, as my father did for 30 years before me. We were called, they were called the Sounti Mawiomi. The difference being that they are at the table with elected chiefs as they talk about negotiations moving forward. 
And while it's not always easy, they always found ways to work together. It is important that both Indian Act governments and traditional governments work together, just the same as we in a minority must attempt to work together. I ask today for leaders in Canada, leaders of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, to commit to making our relationship work. Political action, not police action, has the ability to decrease tensions. It is the only way. Political discussion and negotiation is what is needed, not inflammatory rhetoric. We need to inspire hope. If nothing else during this speech, I want to make sure to say that there is still hope. The politician in me believes that, and the protester in me believes that, too. We are still here. We are still debating all night. But more importantly, we have been listening all week. We are still listening. And I promise you, we won't stop listening. Reach out to us, and let's get back to negotiating, and let our families from coast to coast to coast get back to work. Like any relationship between families, your partner, when you sit down and talk about the issues, rather than taking extreme positions, that's when we have the ability to grow. We have a chance for growth in our country. We have the ability to take strides and take actions that only have been dreamt about by Indigenous leaders in this country in the past. Let's show that when we say that we are focused on reconciliation, that we show it in all of our actions. Thank you. Alalio. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member for his comments. Um, I enjoyed his remarks, and thank you for more information about um, his own personal background and his worldview. But I, I just got to ask, I, you know, all the all the talk then about communication and working together and listening and wanting to hear, you know, a variety of different opinions and everybody having equal value and all this stuff, like. You know, gr great. I think we. All hope, I hope we all agree on all of that in principle. Except that, then, can I just ask him? Does he disagree with the prime minister's exclusion of the leader of the opposition from the meeting today with all of the other leaders in this house? An opposition leader who actually got more votes than their leader in the last election and represents entirely the province of Alberta, except for one seat. Entirely the province of Saskatchewan and a good chunk of Manitoba. I mean. Doesn't everything that he just said, all of which I agree with on principle, fly in the face of that very act? For Sydney Victoria. I'd like to thank the member opposite for her question. And uh, I think that where we've gotten to in, in a country requires for us to, to talk with respect. And when the leaders in the opposite can talk respectfully about Indigenous issue, I applaud that. Not often have I saw in this House where I've sat up, stood up and had to listen, do I feel that there's been a respectful discussion from uh, the Leader of the Opposition. And I've, I've heard his comments today, and I heard his comments when he was presenting in front of the Assembly of First Nations back last year, and when he was asked by chiefs if he could differentiate himself from Stephen Harper. He could not. And he said, doubled down and said, well, Stephen Harper wasn't so bad to the Indigenous people and was booed out of the room. And so maybe if the member opposite spent a, a little more time listening to some of the talk from the chiefs and hereditary chiefs, that he'd be invited when, the, when the, our Prime Minister wants to sit down and talk about what's best for all Canadians, including Indigenous people. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie mon collègue pour son intervention, où il a notamment parlé de réconciliation. Quand on parle de réconciliation, aussi, c'est important de ne pas laisser dégénérer des crises et d'intervenir. En décembre 2019, le quotidien de Guardian de Londres révélait que la GRC a donné instruction à ses officiers d'employer autant la violence à volonté pour démanteler les camps Wet'suwet'en et que les tireurs d'élite seraient déployés sur le terrain. Alors, dès lors, Ottawa aurait dû prendre une décision suite à cet article-là, à cette nouvelle-là, 
Une citoyenne de ma circonscription de Sheffield, Donna Kane, est venue me voir à mon bureau au mois de janvier pour me parler de ces préoccupations-là sur cette question de ces tireurs d'élite particulièrement. Si nous, si c'est une citoyenne de Sheffield, si le Bloc qui avait émis un communiqué en décembre avait vu la situation et qui avait déjà vu que ça serait explosif, comment se fait-il que le gouvernement n'ait pas intervenu alors? Il a fallu d'ailleurs que la citoyenne revienne à mon bureau dernièrement, au mois de janvier, lorsqu'elle a vu effectivement que le problème dégénérait et qu'encore une fois, il y avait des actes de violence contre les Wet'suwet'un. Alors, j'aimerais savoir, quand on parle de réconciliation, comment mon collègue voit l'importance d'agir et de ne pas laisser dégénérer. The Honourable Member for Sydney Victoria. I'd like to thank the member opposite for a question, and I, I kind of reject the premise that reconciliation isn't formed out of crisis. I feel that reconciliation has been something that's 150 years or more in the making, and that we can all look at recent events and question this government on, on our actions. But has any other government in the past 150 years acted differently towards Indigenous people? I grew up in a Mi'kmaq community. I live this every day for 40 years. This is not something I get to come to a, a meeting here and, and just say, this is what's happening. I've lived this and saw it my whole life. So it's not to say that this is something that has just recently transpired. Can we do better? We can all do better. Our Prime Minister has said that as part of it. But the biggest thing is what this government is trying to do is take steps towards reconciliation differently than all governments in the past, including Oka, Ipperwash, or, or the other protests that have happened across this country. What we're trying to do is ask that we speak respectfully, speak to people and negotiate and dialogue. And this is what reconciliation means. It's having that patience. Indigenous peoples have had patience in Canada for more than 150 years. This is, we're asking most of these, and, and just to make it in terms of, let's put this in perspective. There, there's three million Indigenous people out there. There's less than a thousand protesting. So if we look at it that way, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time seeing a lot of the comments over the past few weeks, and I, and I just, I know I'm kind of rambling here, but I get going, and because I live this, this is not just something that is a debate for me. Order. But I do believe that our government <coughs> is taking the steps moving forward that are necessary to foster reconciliation. Okay. Thank you. We're going to resuming debate. I, I see that there are many people standing for questions and comments. I'm, I'm going to do my best to ask members to kind of keep their interventions to about one minute so we can maybe even get three uh, questions on a five-minute round. But uh, I appreciate that members want to take the time to express their arguments in this case, and we, we need to give them some latitude to do that as well. So we're going to a resuming debate, and the Honourable Member for Foothills. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I will be uh, sharing my time.